book of Romans, hasn't it been great? Yes. Have you learned anything special during this? How many here got your Christian doctrines down? Do you know what the word doctrine means? Teaching. 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 Okay, what's the word dogma, dogma mean? Man's teachings. Doctrine, Christian doctrine's good. Christ's teachings, uh, Paul's teachings, Peter's teachings, all go around, center around Christ. Amen. But dogma is man's teaching about Christ. And how many know dogma can get out of there? I didn't come up with a word, you know. I mean, some people can have some pretty strange things, you know, uh, showing up and stuff. All right. So the book of Romans. Now, don't look at all what the chapter's about. Let me ask you this question. Of all of these 16 chapters, we haven't got 16 yet, but uh, which one has been your favorite? Anybody want to throw in one of their favorite? Yeah, BJ. Because reminded, you know, to be mindful of other people and how they feel and how they believe. Very good. Romans chapter 14, she says, to be mindful of other people and not to put a stumbling block there, right? So in other words, sometimes... I, it's my pastor says you can say the right thing but you know how we are as human beings we could say the right thing the wrong way or we could have the wrong motive behind it amen so we want to make sure that whether it, we do anything it says not to cause our brother to stumble anybody else have another favorite chapter chapter three chapter three what did you like about chapter three Yep, we all come short of the glory of God. Reminds us how much we need Jesus. Amen. Because we know what happens to people without God and how bad they can get. And we know what happens to people when they become religious about God but don't have a personal walk. We see that in chapter 2. And chapter 3 reminds us we're all sinners and in order to be saved by grace. Amen. All right, and then one other. Uh, Joe, did you have one you want to, one of your favorite chapters in the, in the book? It's already been mentioned, but chapter three. Yep, chapter three. Yeah, man. Kind of keeps us balanced in that. Amen. One of my favorites is Romans 12. About, you know, submitting yourself and renewing your mind and knowing the perfect and the good, you know, acceptable will of God. And then understanding the motivational gifts in people. I guess from a pastor's perspective, it probably was something like that. Anybody else want to want to add one? We've got three, four so far. Any more? Okay, let's go on. All right, we're going to go all the way down to where it says chapter 15, okay? Right in the end of that paragraph underneath uh, your notes, just before point. Okay, chapter 15. How important is it to hear one another's burdens and to please your neighbor, right? Okay? Now, we go all the way down to chapter 16, all right? Here in chapter 16, we see Paul giving honor to Phoebe. Anybody know right off the hand, offhand who Phoebe was? Okay, moving right along. It tells you right there if you read. It says, giving honor to Phoebe, a deaconess of the church at Corinth. Paul, being a gracious man, goes on to honor fellow laborers at the church at Rome. He lists a whole bunch of them. So hopefully we got what we could get for you, and the rest just didn't have a lot of information about them, but we can tell you what they were doing. All right, and then Paul warns how serious it is to cause division. Folks, how serious is it to cause a division in a church? Real bad. I mean, God says there's six things that he hates, and seven is an abomination. He that causes discord among the brethren. Now, we're going to read that. It also says to mark them in the King James, but it also says note them that are divisive. What's a divisive person? Can anybody tell me? Somebody, either in their conversation or by gossip or by whatever it means, they come in and divide people up. They could divide people up in parties, in color. Um, divide people up by countries, you know. 
I believe when you come to America, you strip your country off, you become American. And then, see, I'm American, I'm a Scottish American, you know? And I don't mind to be American, but I, our, we came from Scotland. If you look us up, we have a huge castles and all that kind of stuff. We probably kicked out of Scotland, came over to the Americas, you know. But anyway, you see, so we, we love our heritage. We love some of our traditions, but we're Americans. Can you say amen? And so Paul say, one of the worst things you can do in a church is create division. In fact, you've heard me say this, and I'll say this personally. That's why I don't preach my convictions. By that I mean I don't preach what I feel is right or what, what I feel is wrong. Preach the word. Can you say amen? So a conviction, for example, is what God says to you about his word. So somebody can be convicted, and so they don't watch TV. I'm just going to be, you know, but that's what God wants them to do. But see, if I preach that God doesn't want you to watch TV, that's not for everybody. That's my conviction. And what that will do, if I'm not careful, it will divide people up. And we can see how divisive and how divided our nation seems to be. It seems to be calming down. Bless God. Keep on praying. But so division is a real bad thing in the church. Gossip causes division. Tell bearing, here's one, don't know what a bearing a tale is. It's when you tell a story about somebody that the other person that you're telling it to doesn't need to hear it. For example, if you bring up my past, my past is dead, it's fluffy. We don't dig up fluffy. I'm forgiven and everything like that, but there are those people who will dig up my fluffy. If they do, just go, hey, you dig up your own mess, leave other people's alone. Can you say amen? amen? Because why? We get all entangled and things are just wastes of time. Amen. You don't see me sitting around talking about you, do you? <laughs> just moving right on. So let's finish up. So division is very important that we understand that it's not to be even named in church. And Paul warns about how serious it is. And then finally he goes to the greetings of Paul's companions to the church at Rome, and then finally a salutation. So that's what 16 is about. Say, I got it. All right, now we got an intro scripture about how much Paul loves to pray. So if you'll go down to the thing where it says text there, and if you want to look up the scripture, it's Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 18. And Paul loved to pray. Now, one of the things that he said, he says, you know, all of these things I am troubled, but the thing that most troubles me, Paul said, is the care for the churches. How many churches did he start? Quite a few. How many disciples did he win to the Lord? Quite a few. In fact, the church at Rome and a lot of his disciples, we're going to see that. But Paul was a man of prayer. They say about Paul that he had huge callous knees. He was not very tall, about 5'2", about 5'3", five five they say. He was beaten, stoned, so he was kind of broken all up. Paul at one time said, you looked at me and you would have given me your arm or your eyes because I was so beat up. You know? And one time he says, this large letter I've written with my own hand, some of the old denominations say, yeah, Paul was so beat up that he wrote with a 1B pencil. Large no, he was talking about a large letter in volume. You know, quite a few pages. Can you say amen? All right, so let's go on. Out of this love to study. All right. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul, just to, I've just picked one of the ones that he says, I love to pray for you. But look what he's praying over at the church of Ephesus. Look what he says. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith, Paul's saying, I heard of your faith at Ephesus. Wow, you guys got a lot of faith in the Lord. Amen. And how you love all the saints. Verse 16. Do, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Did you pray for your church today? Did you pray for your pastors today? Did you love up your nation how about Israel right now seems to be under attack? Boy, that Middle East was absolutely calm for four years. Now what happened? That's because the serpent is gaining control again. 
over the world. We need to come against him. Remember, he's the one that starts wars. He's the one where you can't trust anybody. He's the one that really is a decisive person that divides people up. That's how he thrives. The more he can get you mad at your neighbor, the more he'll thrive between the two, and he will tear your lives apart. So the best thing you could do is walk in love, have lots of joy, walk in the peace of God, and walk with Jesus. Can you say amen? And so Paul wants the revelation of who they are, like the disciples that follow Jesus, to be at the church at Rome. So he says, I, after I've heard of your faith and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom. Everyone, spirit of wisdom. What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Knowledge is the accumulation of facts, things, people. It's facts. And wisdom is the ability to put those facts to action. So knowledge is hearing. Wisdom is doing. Hearing and doing. How do we have our feet on the foundation? Jesus said, if you hear my sayings and do them, you are like the person that builds his house on the rock. Wise person. He says there's two wisdoms. One wisdom comes from earth, James chapter 3, and one wisdom that comes from God, from heaven. Can you say amen? Get a chance. Look at the correlation between the two. And he says that the, God may give you the spirit a wisdom. Now you may say, what is a spirit of wisdom? Who is the Holy Spirit? He's God, isn't he? And he's praying that upon all the saints, that the ability to apply the word with wisdom be upon them. How many know you can apply the word, but sometimes it's not with wisdom? <laughs> Moving right along. Okay, and look it. And that, he says, that God may give you the spirit of wisdom and what? Everyone say revelation. What is revelation? It means revealing. That God may give you wisdom about what he reveals to you. You couldn't get saved until you knew you needed to get saved. Until it was revealed to you, you needed to get saved. Remember that we shared in about the last couple of weeks? You didn't come up, up with anything on your own. So even... Your ability to know to get saved came from others sharing Jesus, from maybe some sorrow in your life and your past, but you didn't come up with it on your own. Ding! Maybe I ought to get saved. <laughs> the idea behind it is, without God, we can do nothing. And without God, we are nothing. So now we got it. Well, with God, I can do all things. Through Christ that strengthens me. All right, so he says, I pray the spirit of wisdom and the revealing of God's knowledge, revelation of the knowledge of God, be what? That you get wisdom and revelation of him. Okay, what's the one thing the world won't teach you? Wisdom and revelation of God. Teach you about everything else. I'm talking about the world system. Okay, not just good people meaning well. <laughs> okay. All right, so it goes on further, verse 18. That the eyes of your understanding, what? Being enlightened. Here's what I was taught in Bible college. I was taught that you get the word here, and then it trickles down to here. Now, where does God live? After you got born again, he come into your spirit, right? Doesn't he know everything? Yeah. So here's what, what happens. Now when you read the word, God who knows the word will bear witness in you about the word and your eyes and your understanding will get a revelation. And suddenly you'll see something in the word that will apply directly to you. And what you're to do, how you're to do it, who you're to be, and, and how you're going to go along in that way. Well, I know when God revealed to me that I was going to be a pastor, I told him No. Listen, the people that run around, oh, 
using names, I'm a prophet, I hear from God, stuff. You be careful a lot of that. Because that's bragging. God doesn't brag. Listen, if you've got wonderful gifts in you, and you do, let the gifts in you brag. Don't brag about what you have. Let what you have display to everybody who you are. You got that? I don't know if I could say that again, but that's what we're supposed to do. That way we don't get in the way. We don't try to take into the glory. God gets all the glory. We get all the blessings. God doesn't need to give us streets of gold. He already has them. He doesn't need to pay any of his bills. He already, his bills are paid. I'm just joking. Who does? Who needs all that? We do. So keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on finding. Why? Because God wants to make Satan jealous. He has but a short time. And if you're prospering right in the middle of his face, while he's trying to tell you you're ugly, you're never going to amount to anything, and you're having the time of your life, something's wrong with what he's saying. <laughs> Don't listen to the, the, the turkey. It says, a voice of a stranger we shall not follow. Romans, excuse me, John 10. All right, so we want to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him so that the eyes of our understanding be, be enlightened. So as we get it, it floats up into our understanding. Now, let me show you. First comes knowledge, then you try to apply the word. So you see, a baby doesn't know how to walk real good right away, but it, it tries. There's something in them that keeps on trying. Well, when we're baby Christians, God is the unction. Can you say amen? And we just have to start doing the word. And so the knowledge comes, and then we apply wisdom. What happens is when knowledge comes and we apply wisdom and we see that it works, we gain understanding. Ah, that's how the kingdom works. Ah, in order for me to be exalted by God, I must humble myself. In order for God to bless me spiritually, I have to forgive everybody their trespasses. And I have to really watch where I put my eyes. Not on the world, not on others, not on myself, but I have to really watch. And then the eyes of my understanding will become enlightened. I will may know what is with all the saints, the hope of the blessings of God. That's who you are. But remember, there's a lot of distractions out there. So let's go on. A couple of points. Number one, Paul was a man of prayer. Let's be one like him. Amen. Man and woman of prayer. Right? God strengthened the churches. Strengthened the churches. Amen. And then secondly, Paul wanted the people to know the Lord and experience his power in their life. So the church at Rome, remember, they didn't have a pastor. They didn't have a lot of revelation knowledge. So Paul wanted to lay down good Christian teachings so they had something to build on. In fact, he talks about that in 1 Corinthians 3. Be careful of what foundation that someone builds upon. Remember? Other than Jesus Christ. I believe the foundation another builds on, but take heed what manner you build upon. You can do it in the flesh, you can do it in the spirit, right? Amen. So, all right. Romans chapter 16. You ready for this? dun da da dun dun A, 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 com, a commending to Phoebe, okay? Uh, Romans 16, 1 and 2. I commend, I commend you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church. The word servant there is deaconess, okay? Of the church at Caesarea or Corinth. All right? You with me? That you may receive her in the Lord in the manner worthy of the saints, and a sister in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also. This lady was one of those workers. She was a host. She actually was a deaconess, probably a head deaconess in the church at Corinth. 
and her job was hospitality, seeing to the needs. And usually what they did is they picked the women that were, uh, they were seasoned, okay? They were usually uh, widowers or widows, and they picked them so they keep them busy. Besides staying at home, they could serve and do feel good. Can you say amen? And she was an exceptional deaconess. In fact, so exceptional, Paul lets her know. What you don't know is also Phoebe traveled from Corinth with Paul's letter to Rome. So either she was with the group that came to Rome to deliver the letter, or she delivered it personally herself. Say, now I know about Phoebe. All right. Yeah, there's not much in there, but... Look where you can. She's in the book of Acts, so. All right. So it says, I commend you to Phoebe's sister, the servant of the church at Caesarea, that you may receive her in the Lord. Amen? Isn't that sweet? We need to receive the gifts of God, not be suspicious of them. Amen? You can tell a tree by its fruit. If the tree is bragging but it has no fruit, don't listen to the tree. <laughs> But if the tree's got all kinds of fruit, but maybe it doesn't quite look like it should, but boy, it's got a lot of good fruit on there. Maybe you shouldn't judge by your eyes. Maybe you should judge by the fruit. Now, Jesus said those things for us to get by the physical surface. How many here know that we don't always look our best? Amen. We don't always look our best. And do you want people to stop listening to Christ just because you don't have any makeup on? <laughs> Hello, some people, they can't receive from others because they either don't act right or don't, you know, it's too much suspicion out there. Do you know how to recognize when the word of God's coming out of somebody? Do you know how to recognize it? There's an anointing on it. Amen. The spirit of God bears witness to the truth. Can you say amen? amen. They're not braggadocious. They're not condemnative. They're not telling you you ought to do this and better straighten up. That's not the gospel. The gospel is, is this what it says? This is what we should be doing, and God's going to help us to do it. We want the word. Can you say amen? Because God brings us out of our old self, according to James, by the word of God. So the more word of God that a pastor or somebody can get in you or that you can get in yourself, the more like Jesus you will become because God has more to work with. Hello? Have you ever tried to hold up a, a wet noodle? <laughs> we need God in us to hold us up. Can you say amen? amen. You can't really point at anything with a wet noodle. <laughs> you know, and we got too many wet noodles around that. Nobody without a back, you know, they don't have any backbone. It's kind of a, more like a wishbone. <laughs> anyway, let's go on further. All right. So basically, commending to Phoebe, she was also a seasoned, everyone say seasoned. Because the Bible tells us in Timothy, don't lay hands on somebody who's a novice. Do you know what a novice is? Somebody who's a beginner. Because they could get puffed up in pride. You know, one of the first things I did when I became a teenager is I found out how stupid my mom and dad supposedly became. They didn't. I just came, became full of myself. See, that's a time in our life when we get, there's a drive in us to learn and grow and develop. And if we're not careful, the old enemy will take that and we'll start thinking we have arrived and nobody else has. Now, take that and put it into Christianity. Do you think there might be a Christian or two that might think they got a handle on things? Hello? And when really everybody can see that they don't? Jesus talked about them. He said that there are religious people you want to pick the fruit off of them, but they have thorns. He says, do men pick figs from thistles or grapes from thorns? Uh-uh. Because you're going to get burnt. Really what Jesus is saying is, if you're going to represent God, be sweet. Let the God part come out. If you're having a bad day, go pray. Amen. Don't let crabby carry come out. What do you want? That's a dumb question. Why'd you ask me that? You know, <laughs> thorn, thistle, thorn, thistle. 
You know, somebody says, you know, we, we don't give out roses anymore for Mother's Day because the thorns, a couple of thorns on each one remind them of their children. <laughs> I didn't say it. All right, moving right on. Okay, not only that, but number three, she was a good at her ministry. Remember, remember Martha and Mary? Martha, Martha. Martha was troubled. She was one of the uh, deaconess. And Mary was a student. And so we want to make sure there's balance. You've got to have servitude as well as receiving. You can't have more going out than you got coming in. Can you say amen? So you've got to have enough word coming in so when you do minister to people, you have something to give them. But there are people who don't pray and who don't get in the word. They don't tank up. And by the way, there are lines in the gas now. Uh, moving right along, you see. And what we, but they, they don't, we don't tank up like we should. What happens when your cell phone battery goes down? You're smart enough to plug it right on in. And boy, if you're real spiritual, you'll do it before it goes dead. Christians. Every day, plug in. Be so filled with God, people will bump into you and get healed. Amen. Why not? That's how the disciples were. Peter and John, they're just barely going on their way. And there's that guy at the gate, beautiful. He's just sitting there. Every day he's sitting there at the gate, beautiful. He should have got healed when Jesus went by there. I'm hamming it up. But Peter and John just, la, 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 Jesus is good. Isn't God good? Praise the Lord. And they see this same guy and they go, the guy goes, alms, alms. He always treats the same people he always sees coming for prayer like he met them the first time, the guy at the gate. So here's Peter and John again at the gate and suddenly the Spirit of God came on him. And Peter says, hey, look on us. Silver and gold, we don't have. But what we do have, we're going to release on you. I changed the words a little bit so you could see it. And they learned to release God out of them. And it says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, reach down and grab him, Jesus Christ, get up. Didn't ask him, how do you feel? <laughs> Does it feel any better yet, Bunky? No, he grabbed him and pulled him up. Where did that guy go? He went right into the dead church, jumping and shouting and screaming for Jesus. Now, where are the people of God that are willing to get challenged to reach out there and lay hands on the sick, whether they get healed or not? Your job is not to heal them. Your job is to pray for them, lay hands on them. And Paul wanted the church at Rome to recognize how much power they had as believers. So now he's doing the one thing, honoring Amen. all these people. Now, folks, if you don't honor other ministries and other people, yes. people are not going to honor you. I can remember Catherine Kuhlman listening to some of her old sermons yes. and some, uh, you know, um, uh, Edward Cole and and William Branham and some of those guys, you can look at some of their films. One of the things they did is they acknowledged and greeted people, made people feel welcome and comfortable before they had their meetings. Why? Because you don't want anybody coming in and being at odds with you if you had something really heavy to pray because our, our preaching, your preaching, your teaching, my teaching isn't supposed to be with enticing words of man's wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and in power that our faith not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God Amen. you see power of God if there's no power of God in my life I'm going to go seek why yes. because the one who has the power lives in me he lives in you too and Jesus says in John 14 12 the works that I do shall you do also. And even greater works than these shall you do because I go to be with the Father. Amen. Because Jesus rose from the dead and gave us the kingdom, and in his name we can go everywhere, the Lord working with us, 
will confirm his word with sign following. The problem is a lot of people aren't preaching his word. They're preaching you better, so you better clean it up, better get it together, making people feel guilty to come to church. Listen, if you don't come to church, but you still love the Lord, I'm going to leave my hands off you. I'd rather you be in church. But if you don't come to church, I'm not going to be standing before the Lord and, and be, the Lord say to me, why did you condemn that person? That's the reason they, they didn't come to church is because there's too many people pointing their, their finger at them and telling everybody what's wrong with them. Hello? We're not supposed to be doing that. Can you say amen? In fact, just think about it. I want you, before the evening's done, think about two, three things you can say about everybody here that's good. Just think about it. Whether or not we'll share it or not, we'll see. All right, so you ready? Okay, greeting to the Roman believers, Romans 16, 3 through 17. There's a lot of believers here. So somebody would say, was this all the church at Rome? No. But these are your main workers and the people that really wanted to get the information from Paul so they would go on with their walk. Can you say amen? So we're going to see who these people are. So it says in 16 verse 3, um, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Ephratus. If I mispronounce these names, you'll forgive me, right? who is the first fruits of Achaia, is one of the first people born out of there, to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Androdicus and Junia, my countrymen, fellow Jews, and my fellow prisoners, who are of uh, note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. These people got saved before him. Isn't that cool? Greetings to Amplius, my beloved in the Lord, great your, uh, excuse me, greet Urbanus and the fellow worker in Christ, some of these names, and Steskus, uh, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristotelus, 11. Greet Herodian, my countryman, another Jew. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. So see all of these disciples? They came from people. A lot of them were in the house. A lot of these places had Christian houses where when the, the disciples would get, grow weary in the night, they would hear, oh, come over, we'll dine and we'll feed you. And they would go stay at some of these people's houses. Isn't that great? Amen. To think about that nowadays. <laughs> Unless you know him personally, you're not going to show up at somebody's house. All right. What do you want? No. <laughs> okay. Where do I leave off? Okay. Yeah. Verse 12. Greet uh, Teriphania and Typhus, who had labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved uh, Pierces, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet um, Asiscorus and Philjon and Hymenus and Particabus and Hymenes and the brethren who are with them. So that you can see all the people there in Rome. Now these are all like head people, leaders of other people. I'm not saying that they were deacons and all. I'm just saying that these are the ones that are laboring in these fields. And so Paul has taken the time to honor them. Amen. Isn't that sweet? He's taking the time to honor these. I got a few, but I didn't get them all. I couldn't find them all. But he mentions them because they're precious to him. And I don't know about you, but there's people that you can remember that are very precious to you. Lots of disciples through my growing up and being saved and coming to the home of the Lord. You know, Peggy's one of them right there, you know, from way back. How many years? Since 1980. Since 1980. Wow. Uh, that's a year after my son was born. 
79. Anyway, so go beyond all that. So let's go on. And verse 15, greet Philagas and Julia, uh, Nerus and his sister, and Olympus and the saints that are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. <laughs> you know, have you, the best way I can explain it, have you seen how an Italian person, how they just show respect? We're not talking about lip smacking, you know. We're not talking about sloppy agape. No, no. We're talking about giving respect. Folks, it just seems, you ever notice that? Now, I know you guys respect me and I respect you. But, you know, it just it seems like the, the old respect from 30, 40 years ago, the handshake and the looking in the eyes, just seemed that just kind of deteriorated away. You know what? But among Christian brethren, respect for one another and love for one another, let it always be next to Jesus in our heart. Amen? All right, so note, who were some of these disciples? All right, let's, let's look. Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla was the wife of Aquila, converted under Paul's preaching in the book of Acts at Corinth. Okay, Apetius, first convert of Alcaea, you know, and everybody just loved that because there were a whole bunch of pagan people, and he gets saved out of that. So to Paul, these people are precious. So he puts a little ioendos in there, but we really can't crawl into Paul's head truly how, how that person must have ministered to him. What if Paul was sick and that person helped him, you know? He couldn't quite mention all of these things, okay? Point three, Andronicus and Julia, fellow kinsmen, that means fellow Jews, Jews who came to Christ before Paul. Point four, there's Amplius, who chose Paul's, uh, who was close to Paul. Then uh, Urbanus and Stiusk, boy, that one's hard, our fellow laborers, and then Antichbulus, household. They all hung out together. You know, it's kind of like a certain people would get saved, and then a whole bunch of people go fall in because they all hang out at that house. You follow what I'm saying? And then the rest are head deacons serving in the church at Rome, faithful to Paul. They were to, um, and then seven, they were to greet each other and respect one another. Can you say amen? So you get a chance. I don't know if you have one, but you can actually look up this scripture where Paul's going through these names and do what I did and go to a, not to a concordance, but go to a, let's see what they're called, a commentary. I would... Barnes Notes, or, or Webster's Commentary, will list the ones that they have some facts on, if you really want to find out a little more about these people. Can you say amen? And if you are, like I can see your faces, like, okay, I'll meet them and greet them when I get to heaven. <laughs> no, bless your heart. But you know, it's really neat. I remember all the people that helped me when I was in the ministry. Oh, I'm, and I needed a lot of help. When I first got saved, I got saved, and then I got spirit-filled all at the same time. Slayed on the spirit, I got saved, asked Jesus in my heart. Then the spirit of God must have filled me because I had no idea. I ended up on the floor, and then I'm laughing, I'm crying, and now I start speaking in tongues. So I thought that must have been the born-again experience, and it was. I just got the whole load right there. You know, but there were people that helped me. There was Brother Basinger. Brother Basinger, when I got joined, he was probably 79. And his sister, Sister Basinger, Senior, I forget her first name. Earl was his name, Earl and Basinger. They lived in Sumner. And they're the ones, these people now help disciple me. They're the ones that had the talking dog. Now, I'm on TV, and I realize it's Bible study, but I was told by my pastor, Brother Cyrus and Anna Cyrus, that uh, Brother Basinger, old Pentecostal guy, not very, he only had a fifth grade education, but God taught him how to read through the Bible, and they had been with the Lord years and years and years and years through the old Pentecostal movements of Susan Street, 
So they know what it's like, you know, just have some. Well, they ended up getting their, do their dog talked. It was a little chihuahua. I said, no. No, yeah, come on over. He says, goodbye, where you going? And all that kind of stuff. So they invited me over for dinner, you know, so we went over for dinner. And sure enough, when we got ready to go, the dog looked at me and he says, where are you going? Can I go? Almost clear. And I looked at that and something in my spirit was going, yeah. We don't have talking dogs. I was a spook. I was a demon. But they didn't know because they loved the dog. So I looked at the dog and I said, in Jesus' name, you come out. They went in the back room, come out. And the dog rolled over. He ended up leaving. And he, so the next Sunday, come back to, but this, I mean, I mean, there are people who witness this thing. So I'm not, you don't think I'm just nuts telling you this. And so they came back the next Sunday service. I said, so darn this thing, after you came, the dog doesn't talk anymore. <laughs> Seems really mellow. It doesn't seem nervous and weird. I says, oh, I didn't tell him. So anyway, so they helped bring me up. And we went, and here's the deal. I believe that God had me go to that place to get saved because the man could relate to me and the others that were there. And because he could relate, we would go every day to his house and learn. So we went every day to his house except for we give the evenings off. I'm serious. And there was 30 of us, but at least five or six of us would be there every day, and I was one. Because I, the first time I went, I saw a miracle. And I wanted to know the Jesus of miracles. And, of course, they just discipled us and all kinds of things happened, which is a later story, okay? But those who disciple you, those that speak into your life, Learn to discern the voice of God as versus the voice of people, okay? Are you with me? So, all right, to avoid divisions, avoid divisive persons if you're going to avoid divisions. That's somebody, in fact, you can hear it on the news. Some of the news people will bring up something and you'll either have to be one side or the other. That's called divisiveness. Hello? Gossip does that. Did you hear about so-and-so? You should stop it right there. No, and I don't want to either. But see, if you go into that, now it gets into a decide. Remember, that's how Satan works. He breaks down trust between each other, gets us to disbelieve. Oh, oh and start rumors or bring up something that happened. You know, I started a lot of rumors back when I was away from the Lord. Yeah, I was away from the Lord, not, not backslidden, but away from God's people for a little while. It, it wasn't a very fun place to be. But I was thinking of myself, feeling sorry for myself, went through all of these terrible things, you know, and how you could self-pity yourself to death. <laughs> I did and came back to Jesus. Can you say Amen. But one of the things that was really hard on me, because I went to some of the people I helped as, as ministers, and, and I'm not, I don't want you to think, and you know, a lot of them didn't know what to say to me because I was a pastor, and I'd gone through that. You know, and it's really a delicate thing, but God's into the restoration business. He's into fixing us. Can you say amen? And woe be to anybody that keep you from being fixed. I'm not going to keep you from being fixed. We have a little statement here at CCM, and that is, I don't care where you've been. As long as I can get you with Jesus and you're going to end up forever in eternity in heaven, can you say amen? So I don't care what your, your past was like. As long as you don't bring your past into the present, you'll be all right here because God will fix you. And other great churches too. All right, so let's look at this. Romans 16, 17 through 20. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses. What is, what is one of the greatest tools Satan uses in a church? Offenses, right? 
and divisions. You offended me. Okay, so I try to get, tell Christians, don't wear a chip on your shoulder. Don't get up in the morning looking for somebody to offend you because the devil will oblige you. And there are some people who live on that. So you want to pray, God, that I be not tempted with offense. When an offense comes, I won't take it personally. Can you say amen? Know the difference between when somebody corrects you, they're not attacking you personally. They're commenting about your performance. And we could all use a performance change. You go and tune your car up, don't you? Or at least you should. <laughs> all right, moving right along, okay? So people, there are people who just live to cause divisions. Oh, I like to pastor up the street. Your pastor's not so good. Divisions. Hello? Oh, I turn that, turn that guy off. I don't like his preaching. Divisions. And that person that does that has no power in their life. They probably haven't led anybody in the Lord for months or maybe years because they're too busy being an armchair warrior picking on everybody's fault. And Jesus said, why do you uh, behold the stick or the speck that's in your brother's eye and can't, you don't know about the planks that you have. <laughs> you got yourself a, a piece of plywood. You know, don't worry about a toothpick in somebody else's life when you are wearing a plywood around. Hello. Think about your plywood and stop commenting about others. Moving right along. Okay, so verse 18. For those who are such do not serve our Lord. Who do they serve? but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. The word simple there means innocent. Have somebody come in and they just so happen to be the best prophesier there is. But they only came the first time and it seems like took over the service. Giving everybody a word and all. Is that in order? Of course not. That's all ludicrous, goofy stuff. And it happens too much in the Northwest. People traveling around, they don't belong to any church. They're like a traveling kidney with a word. And they come right into a church and they'll give people words. They'll pull them off aside. And, I got a word for you, Piggy. Sell your dog and move to Alaska. And Piggy looks and says, I don't have a dog. <laughs> and I don't like the cold. You see what I'm saying? So there are those people, you got to, they serve themselves. They're after food and money. Listen, I'd rather, you know, not ask for any money. God supplies our need here. But, you know, we do give opportunity to give. But, hey, you're not going to hear, hey, if you don't buy this red string, we're going to go under. After all, you need this red string, which is 100 bucks, going to chase the devils away. I mean, you see people merchandising and doing crazy things. Paul wants them to be sound in what they know. Can you say amen? Can you discern right from wrong? Yes. Good from evil? Amen. And it says for you to discern each tree that speaks to your life, whether the fruit is good or the fruit is not. Amen. And I figured, hey, my fruit must be semi all right you wouldn't be here <laughs> just joking right dear she says i married him you know all right so let's move on okay uh so we got verse eight, so for your obedience okay verse 19 for your obedience has become known to all therefore i am glad on your behalf but i want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. I had a, a, a brother explain that to me. Be wise about being good. We overcome evil with who Jesus Christ anointed of God who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. But it says be simple concerning evil. What does that mean? If somebody wants to treat you evil or do something mean to you, be like a little baby. Be simple about it, innocent, and pay it no mind. 
best way he said was, it's kind of like a little infant. Just cooing and googling and kind of, you know, drooling on itself. And you look at it and say, man, you're ugly. And it's still cooing and drooling and everything because it's not caught up in your life. You see, I'm caught up in what Jesus wants me to do and for him. And the lives that I help speak into, he helps me see from a right perspective to see you the way God sees you. So I'd be, I'd be, I must be innocent if you just turn around and, you know, call me a name and do all kinds of, I'm, I'm going to look at you and go, huh? sorry, are you having a bad day? Rather, they chalk it up as they're having the bad day and you're not going to take it personally. Amen? Because the offenses are going to come. But Jesus said, be woe to the one who brings the offense. It's better for a millstone to be hung around his neck than he offend one of my little ones. Woo, Jesus said that. All right, let's finish, okay? All right, so verse 20, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Everyone look at your left foot. Look at your right foot. Satan under defeat. The left one, the right one. He will crush Satan under your feet shortly. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So, number one, avoid those who cause divisions and offenses. Don't hang around them. How are they going to know if they did something wrong? If you're always hanging around somebody that's always causing problems within Christianity, they're always going to think that what they're doing is okay. If you never look at them or pull yourself away from them causing harm like that, they're never going to know because they just think it's all accepted. But when you pull away from somebody like that, now God can deal with them. Just don't get into gossip or anything. So don't hang around somebody that's acting bad because they think what their action is okay. No, no, no. Avoid those who cause divisions and offenses. Note them. They serve only their own self, too. These are always drawing people after them. They want to be doing. Hey, it's what I'm doing for God. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. Let's do this together. Hello. Feeding on the simple and the full of deception and bad motives. I had a guy come in here and, you know, cause division. I mean, it hurts. Then three, be wise in what is good. Can you say amen? Can you recognize what's good? Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, whom doesn't change. So if it's not good and perfect, then we need to discern it. Can you say amen? Sometimes say no to it. Are you with me? And these are always drawing people after them. And then thirdly, be wise in what is good and simple what is evil. What does Proverbs 6, 16 through 20 say? These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. Here's, a, here's another one. Besides hurting somebody, you can do it verbally. Bring up their past just to hurt them. Hello. And he's usually an unstable person that does that. So, Hands that innocent shed blood. Verse 18. A heart that devises wicked plans. Boy, we can get even with that guy. Feet that are swift to running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. Yeah, I saw them do it, and you did not. And those who sow discord among the brethren. You know what a discord is? How many's ever heard a nice piano, a nice guitar? But then if you turn some of the strings, it's discord. When somebody comes in a church and they want self-attention or they're operating in the flesh, it's discord. It sounds like a clanging gong and a smashing cymbal, doesn't it? If I have all prophecy, all wisdom, but not love, I'm a noisy gong. We're having our own gong show. And then finally finishing up, Romans chapter 16, 21 through 25, Paul's companion's greeting. All right, 21 says, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Suspeter, my countrymen, greet you. 
Those are the ones that travel real close to him. Then I, Tertius, who wrote the epistle, greets you in the Lord. See, he was a scribe. Paul dictated and he wrote it. Hello? Happened a lot. What if Paul's hands were all smashed and he couldn't write himself? Rem huh? Yeah, remember he said you would have plucked off your own right hand and gave it to me? But back in those days, they always had it. Somebody always had it. Well, you'd think they would, but not always. But you'd think they would because not everybody was educated, but Paul was very educated. So whatever the reason, he had somebody take, that, take it down. Maybe he had an inspiration, but I don't care. It's good stuff. Can you say amen? amen. Then verse 23, Gaius, my host, and the host of a whole church. This guy had a big place in his house where he ministered to the saints. Greet you, and Erethus, the treasure of the city, greets you. The treasure of the city got saved. Yeah! And Quantius, a brother, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So Paul traveled with a group. He didn't head out by himself, did he? Had a group. Amen. He must have had a band. It was called the Apostles. I'm joking. Amen. So a couple of points underneath that. Number one, Timothy, fellow worker. Did you know what happened to Timothy? In the book of Ephesians, Timothy became the pastor at the church of Ephesus. Amen. And you know what else happened? That was the time that Nero took over and started killing all the Christians. So Timothy had a giant church in Ephesus because people were coming to the Lord by the thousands. The church somewhere ran around 90 to 120,000 people. A little church at Ephesus. <laughs> but when Nero came in and there was one other uh, Caesar, was, they killed people. Did weird stuff. Just completely crazy. And, and immediately, probably 90,000 of the 120,000 people left Timothy's church. And then in 2 Timothy, you hear him being discouraged. And Paul writes to Timothy, he says, don't be discouraged. Amen. How would you like to have 90 to 120,000 people and, and more than two-thirds of them get up and leave? Ah, yeah, you need to be encouraged. So just a little trivia there for maybe you didn't know, okay? Point two, Lucius, prof, he was the prophet and teacher from Serene in Acts 13.1. Okay, you get a chance to read it. Then there's Jason and Sophitur, fellow disciples and deacons to help Paul. Then there was Tertius, the scribe who wrote for Paul's thoughts. Fifth, there was Gaius, host of Paul and opened his house to the Christians. Sixth, there was Aretas or Eratus, city treasurer, and Quantus, a servant brother with him. And then he finally says in seven, grace be with you all. What do we know about God's grace? What is it? Unmerited favor. God gave you his favor even when you didn't deserve it. Grace is God's redemption at Christ's expense. Okay? Right? God giving you everything when you deserved hell, he gave you salvation. Amen. So I would say that was gracious. Amen. So when God said to Paul, Paul was complaining because he was going through it. And Paul said, when God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, yes. he wasn't saying, oh, just hang in there, Paul. Don't get tired, buddy. I'm coming soon. No. He was saying, everything that I gave you at Calvary, everything that I am in you, everything that you are in me, I'm for you, with you, in you, and you're in me, is grace. It's a kingdom full of all kinds of supernatural things. Now take my grace, son, and march through life. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God, you are with me in Jesus' name. If you got something out of that, give the Lord a hand clap.